Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Heather Teplitz, Senior Manager of Exhibits and Sponsorships with the National Apartment Association. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so the National Apartment Association and the National Suppliers Council have recognized the importance of providing valuable tools and different education programs to all of the suppliers and exhibitors for our shows and the industry in general. NEA has partnered for the third year with trade show expert Jefferson Davis with Competitive Edge. Jefferson has been helping to prepare us for the upcoming 2013 NEA Education Conference and Exposition in San Diego and has provided us with tools on marketing and other resources. The Exhibitor Resource Center is a great education resource page where you can view webinars, best practices, how-to articles, and additional exhibition industry resources. The Resource Center is located under the Industry Supplier Center site on the NAAHQ.org website. I highly encourage everyone to access the site and please bookmark and share with others. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will upload it on the Resource Center next week. So with that, Jefferson, it's all yours. Thank you, Heather, um, and good afternoon, everybody. I don't know about all of you listening on today's webcast, but I always felt like, as an exhibitor, the only time I hear from the show organizer is when they want to check or when they send me that big exhibitor service kit telling me everything that I have to do and don't want to do. And so how cool is it to be working with Heather and the team at NAA that cares enough about us as exhibitors to put these type of programs on? Because they understand that their show's not successful unless you, the exhibitor, is successful. So I want to welcome you out to today's session called Secrets of the Isles. We're going to talk about staffing and people. And it's really going to be a two-part type webcast. The first part is going to speak to the exhibits manager about how to select and prepare your exhibit staff for success. And the second part is going to deal with four or five of the most critical skills that a booth staffer needs to possess to be effective on the exhibiting floor. And again, as, as Heather said, we're, this is just one of many topics. Hopefully you've been visiting this supplier center and you've uh, looked at the state-of-the-art exhibit marketing, so you drive qualified booth traffic. If you're a new or first-time exhibitor uh, in the show, you definitely want to view the replay of the first-time exhibitor web briefing and lead management. Uh, when the doors close, the show's not over. It's when the real work begins. So there's a really great webcast up there called State of the Art Lead Management. I kind of view all these as must views for any exhibitor serious about making the show pay off. The fact that you're here with me today, I believe you're serious about it. So welcome. Um, you may be familiar with me. I've been around the industry for a long time. I'm um, kind of um, living and breathing trade shows. And basically, my, my, my goal is to help companies convert trade shows from expensive appearances where they spend the money and they pretty much leave it on the show floor to a profitable, productive investment that delivers value and ROI. If you're exhibiting correctly and you're doing the right things, your exhibit program should be doing two very specific outcomes. Number one, it should be visibly and directly supporting your company's core business objectives. So visibly, directly support your core objectives, primarily in the areas of marketing, sales, customer relationship management. And second, it should be delivering value beyond cost. If you're doing those two things, you are in the top 10% of exhibitors in America, and my hat's off to you. We, both at my company, Competitive Edge, Heather, and the entire team at NAA want to be sure that those two things are happening for your company. So uh, let's start off with a poll here. Um, we're going to um, just do a quick kind of what do you feel most impacts the success of your exhibit. You'll see this flash up on your screen and there's a radio dial button. If, if you feel it is your booth location, where you're located on the show floor, check that button. If you feel it's how big and pretty and how cool your exhibit is, check that button. If you feel it's the quality of your products, your services, check that button. If you feel that it is your company's reputation in the marketplace, check that button. 
you're only allowed to check one, and the, and the question is, which do you feel most impacts your success? I'll give you just a moment. We're at about 60% of you have voted. I'm looking for 100% votes here, okay? If you are looking at your email or you haven't really tuned in with me yet, tune in. I promise you these next 45 minutes are going to be priceless. We're at about 80% on vote. A few of you haven't voted yet. I can see you. <laughs> no, I really can't see you, but I wish I could, but I can't. So let's go ahead. I'll give you just another second. We're at 85%. Uh, We're pushing up near 90. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Let me post the results so we can see kind of what we're looking what's happening with the group. And by the way, we got a great turnout on today's webcast, so thanks everybody for logging in. So, 13% of us feel it's our location on the show floor that most impacts our success. 2% say how big and pretty our booth is. 17% say it's the quality of our product services. 13% feel it's the reputation of our company. And 55% feel it's your booth staff. Okay, so the question was what most impacts. Okay, now location. Exhibit Surveys has been researching shows since 1963. They've done several qualitative and quantitative studies on the impact of location and the ultimate results an exhibit program delivers. And in a contiguous hall show, they can make no direct correlation between physical location and the ultimate results. They can find companies who are front and center and don't get a great results. They can find companies who are in a small booth over in the corner behind two columns near the restroom that have a great show. So here's what I'm saying. Uh, don't rest your hat on the idea that physically where you're located is going to most impact your location. And in fact, if you, you do look at your location and you have a concern, then you've got to do a better job of, of pre-marketing and driving traffic to your booth. And there's a great webcast replay up on the um, Resource Center, so be sure to check that out. A big pretty booth, nice to have. Company reputation, you better have a good company reputation. Product service quality, that's the, that's the price to get into the game. Trade shows are about face-to-face -face contact. All of the other benefits that we get, like visibility, branding, awareness, lead generation, we can get those things through other marketing media and marketing channels. Trade shows are about face, okay? So with that, I would submit that your booth staff is probably the most important factor. And I think by the end of this webcast, you will see crystal clear as to why I would say that. Okay, so let's talk about staffing. Let's kind of get our minds lubricated on this topic here. So I want to start off with some questions in your workbook, and I want you to physically, quickly answer these questions. Number one, okay, we just asked the uh, question of booth staffing. I want you to rank it on critical to not really important. So just jot a phrase down that describes how important you feel it is to your company's success. Next, do you have structure and, and process for determining who goes to the show, selecting? Do you have a formal system in place to communicate with your staff in the weeks and the days leading up during and after showtime? Yes or no? Do you have formal structure in place for preparing them, knowing the company goals, their roles, and, and everything? Do you have some structure and process in managing what happens in the booth in terms of activity and the ultimate outcomes or results that are, are being delivered? Do you have structure and process for those factors, yes or no? Jot it down. And finally, third question, has your staff ever received any form of professional exhibiting skills training? It's a yes or no question, okay? And if they have, was it internal? Was it conducted by you or someone on your team? Or was it external? Did you bring in a professional trainer? Just jot that down, okay? So these are some of the topics that we're going to talk about in today's webcast. So let's start off and, you know, just with a quick cartoon here. It comes from the uh, Dilbert Dogbert series. And you see the lady in here, the guy walks in the booth. He's like, hey, what can you tell me about your products? And she's like, well, they're defective, pretty much like you. <laughs> Obviously not the kind of person that we'd want to have in our booth. And you see, even though this is a bit dramatic in this cartoon, here's the thing. Today, buyers are using trade shows to evaluate the people behind the brands. 
they make judgments about companies based on their interactions with individuals. And all this cart, you know, this cartoon is a little bit over the edge in terms of I don't believe that would happen in any one of your booths. I just want you to know that your booth staff, they're making judgments. They're evaluating your people and they're making judgments about your company based on their evaluations of your people. So let's talk about uh, buying, influencing behavior. I imagine that most of you in some way, shape, or form are using the exhibit program to influence or guide visitors to some next action, hopefully some form of a purchasing action that drives revenue for your company. So let's have a very important talk here right now, okay? There are five major decisions en route to a purchase. And these decisions are present in almost every purchase that happens beyond a true commodity product where there's no relationship required with the company, it's a commodity, and they're buying solely based on price, okay? Decision number one is the people. And, and I, we're saying salesperson, but it's really the people. So as they engage with your company at a show, they're making quick judgments about your booth staff. Do I like this person? Am I comfortable with him or her? Will I open up, communicate, and listen, and share with this person? Do I trust them? Do I believe them? Basically, are you or they the kind of people that they would do with, do business with, and interact with? So they're making these quick decisions, and it's not even a conscious thing. It's happening at the unconscious level. Okay? So the first decision is your people. As you work your way around the question mark here, the, se the second decision is your company. You know, what do you guys do? What are you known for? What's your reputation? What makes you different than other companies that offer what you market? And why is your company a good match for me? Once they've made the company decision, then they move to the product or the service. And they're looking at what is it and what are the features and what are the benefits and how, you know, how does it work, okay? And how does it compare to other products or services? And then they move to money or price. And, and they're looking at things like what's the cost? cost of acquisition, cost of ownership, what's the price, is it competitive, can I afford it, cost justification, financing, all of the money issues. And then the fifth decision is the time to decide or buy. Should I do this now, next quarter, next year, or next lifetime, okay? So, so here's the big aha that I want you to get from these five major buying decisions. The gravitational pull at a trade show is to talk product or service. Somebody walks into the booth, your staff, hey, you familiar with our new whatever? They start talking product or service. They did not make the personal connection. They did not position the company in the mind of the visitor, and that is a mistake, okay? So what you want to do with these five decisions, ideally ensure that these five decisions are not only all being made, but they're also being made in the proper sequence. Okay, it's people buy from people they like. And if two companies look very similar in the product service, the capability, the pricing, they're gonna lean toward the company that they feel the most comfortable with the people. Okay, so we've got to, the first thing that has to happen in the booth in an interaction is we've got to jot this down. Great phrase, by the way, jot this down. Make the human bond, the personal bond, before you go for the business bond. Make the human bond before you go for the business bond. I'm going to give you some examples when we get into the actual working of the booth of how to do that. How to get a person in 30 to 90 seconds to feel comfortable with you, open up and communicate with you, like you, remember you. Okay? So that's the big aha. Remember, people first. All right. So some insights on exhibit staffing, okay? Some things to think about, some of the things we've learned over the 25 plus years in trade shows. Number one, hey, this environment is challenging, okay? Uh, the trade show floor and a field interaction are worlds apart. You've got a very short interaction, three to seven minutes on average. You've got information overload on the part of the visitor. You've got physical and mental fatigue on the visitor's part and on your staff's part. Okay, you've got the competition right down the aisle, right across the hall. It's a challenging environment, okay, and it's different than what your booth staff does in the day-to-day. -day. And if they don't recognize how the environment is different and they don't adapt their behaviors, 
and their communication skills, they're going to make mistakes. Mistakes that are going to cost you booth traffic, mistakes that are going to cost you leads, mistakes that are ultimately going to cost you business and money. Okay, So it's a different environment. My research is finding that 86% of the human beings that are standing on the show floor representing their companies have never had a single hour of skills training and how to do it. Many of them are suffering from what I would call unconscious incompetence. They don't know that they don't know, right? See, trade shows are a weird thing. They don't really teach this stuff in college, you know? And so you have people out there on the show floor that are making these mistakes and they're not even aware they're making the mistakes. And I'm going to point out what some of these are during today's webcast, okay? The people work in your booth at the end of the show, okay? Make it or break it. Why? Because trade shows are about face, okay? Your strategy in terms of staffing should be best people forward. I don't send Michael to the show because Michael happens to be within driving distance of the show and I'm going to save a little money on air and hotel. I send Michael to the show because Michael is the best st staffer that I can possibly send. You got too much on the line here. You got too much financially invested. You got too much human capital invested. Best people forward is the strategy. Okay? And if you haven't done so, I would seriously advise you to look into some form of exhibiting skills training, whether it's an internal using professional curriculum or whether you're bringing in an, you know, a trade show trainer, it will be a huge competitive advantage to your company to do that. And very few companies do it. By the way, less than 10% of companies that I've polled uh, have done professional exhibiting skills training. Huge competitive advantage. Okay, so let's keep rolling here. Grab your pen, grab your workbook, grab a calculator. I'm going to walk you through a quick financial formula that is going to be an eye opener. And I'm going to explain how you can use this with your booth staffing to get them to wake up and smell the concrete to get them to understand the investment that's being made, to get them to raise their game. Okay, so here we go. Write down your total show budget or investment. Okay, so go ahead and do that now. I want you to write that down. My example, I have 20,000. How many booth staff are you sending to the show for the purpose of working the exhibit on average consistently? If I walk in your booth day one at 10 o'clock, you have... X number of people in the booth. If I walk in your booth day two at 2 p.m., you have X number. What is your full-time staffing equivalent? Okay. Now, when I divide these numbers, the first number I get is my cost per staffer. I'm investing $4,000 per staffer. And because often the sales team's travel and entertainment budget doesn't show up on your budget, that might not even be included in this number. So if I throw that on top of it, it's going to go much higher. Then divide your cost per staffer by the number of hours in the show, and you have got your magical number. So this is really giving us some science here to tell us that for every hour your five people are standing in that exhibit, your company is investing $400 in cold, hard cash per hour per staffer. I think your staff needs to know that. I think you need to communicate that to them. I think you need to ask them that if you were paying them $400 an hour to stand in your booth, what would change in their behaviors? What would change in how they saw the, the opportunity? I have a feeling you would see that some perception shift when people see things differently, their behaviors change. Cost per staffer per hour, run it, communicate it, make sure everybody knows. Really powerful game changer. So let's talk now about um, what makes a great booth staffer, okay? World-class booth staffer. If there were physical attributes, if there were skills, if there were temperaments or behaviors, what would those be? Well, let's get firing here. Number one, they love to exhibit and it shows. They love to exhibit and it shows. They've got a positive attitude. 
I, I get near your exhibit, and there's an energy coming off your booth from your people. They look and act like they want to be there. They're standing. They've got an open body posture. There's a smile on their face. They're engaging people. They look and act like they want to be there. You ever seen a booth staffer that looked like they didn't want to be there? I'll bet you're nodding your head yes. What are they doing? If they're, well, they're sitting down in the chair with a sandwich in one hand and a cell phone texting in the other hand. They're just looking and acting like they don't want to be there, okay? Over half of a visitor's decision to look at your, your booth, to even notice your booth, comes down to what your booth staff is doing or not doing. Positive attitude, number one trait. They love to exhibit in the shows. Dependable and accountable. They're going to be where they need to be. They're going to do what they need to do. If you've got them on the schedule from 9 to 1, they don't show up at 9.15 and leave at 12.45. They're there at 8.30 and leaving at 1.30. It, you know, if you ask them to work a certain area of the booth, if you ask them to show, tell, present a certain product, if you ask them to ask specific questions, they do it. Okay? Second attribute. Number three, team player. Exhibiting is a team sport. I also like to call exhibiting a contact sport, okay, because the face-to-face. -face. But they're part of a team, you know, and so everybody's got roles. You have goals for the exhibiting program, and, and your exhibiting team has roles. They know what the roles are, and they play together. The biggest problem I see in the team concept is territory salespeople who only want to engage with people who are in their territory. If they're in their territory, they'll talk to them. If they're not, they'll give them the short shrift and send them on their way. No, that's, that, that cannot fly. You've got to treat every visitor to your booth as if they are in your territory. And I know it's not easy to enforce this, but somebody's got to lay this down, okay? Number four, professional and courteous. You are on the industry's largest stage. There are a lot of eyeballs on you. Not only in your exhibit, but in the hotel lobby, and in the restaurants, and at the receptions, professional and courteous at all times. Hi, hello, please, thank you. The things that we would normally do, these need to happen in the booth, okay? Number five, energy. They have got to be able to stand on their feet, look and act like they want to be there for every single hour in their booth, that they're in the booth, okay? You know, because it's interesting when we watch shows. On day one of the show, the booth staff, everybody's pretty upbeat, right? They're standing, they're smiling, they're greeting people. Day two of the show, they start moving toward the back or the center of the exhibit. They start clustering, talking to one another. Day three, they have what we call approach avoidance. They see a visitor walk up or near the booth, and they turn around and they start shuffling the literature and straighten the booth. They're tired. They've got to be able to stay in the game. So you need people who are energetic. Okay, that can work the exhibit wire to wire. At 4.45, they're the same as they were at 9.15 in the morning. Number six, they've got to be able to walk up to a stranger and go, how you doing? My name's Jefferson, and you are? They don't have to be a bounce-off-the-wall extrovert, but they've got to not be afraid to engage a stranger, okay? And a lot of people, man, when we watch the interactions in a booth, I'm telling you, about a third of the booth staffers look really uncomfortable in that booth, okay? So those are the first six attributes. Here are six more. There are going to be times when traffic in your booth is light or non-existent. And your booth staff is going to need to stand in an open body posture with a smile on their face near the edge of your exhibit and greet people as they pass. They can't fear rejection. Someone shuts them down. Someone doesn't acknowledge them. Someone doesn't respond to them. They can't fear rejection. You're going to get a little bit of rejection, it shows. If they fear it, they'll try it one time, and they'll quit, and then they'll go, I'm not trying that again. Number eight, okay? R write this phrase down. It's not what you tell. It's what you ask. You've got to be an effective questioner. By an effective questioner, they know what questions to ask. They know what the natural flow or sequence of asking these questions are. They know how to ask these questions in the best way, the difference versus an open-ended question or a closed-ended question. Okay, So they've got to be a good questioner, number eight. Number nine, they've got to be a good listener. Okay, 
they listen with their eyes and their ears. They listen to understand, not just to reply or respond. They play things back that they heard to ensure that they actually heard what they thought they heard. Got to be a good listener. One of the fastest ways to build rapport with another human being is to be interested versus interesting and ask really good questions and listen intently. I'm telling you, people like that and it does magic for building rapport and trust. You got to be a good listener. Number 10, they've got to know their stuff. You know, the visitor's BS meter, it's that little meter on their forehead that goes, it's like a, 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 like a speedometer that swings from left to right. They got to know their stuff. As soon as your booth staff doesn't know or they start BSing, I'm telling you, the visitor picks it up. They read it in their body language. They read it in their tonality. They see it in their eye contact. They see it in their mannerisms. Here's something you can do to help with knowledge in your booth. Capture this because it's worth the price of admission today. Ready? Here you go. Whatever services, whatever products you're exhibiting, featuring, focusing on in the booth, write down the top five questions that you get hit with over and over again and have the best thinker or thinkers in your company script the answers. Feed these FAQs to your entire team, practice, drill, rehearse it in your pre-show meeting, and you will have a top 5% booth staff on the show floor. Knowledgeable number 10. Number 11, write this next phrase down, less is more. Man, you can't get long and deep. You've got to assume that every visitor that walks into your exhibit is completely at the point of information overload. They can't hear. They can't understand. They can't process one more fact, feature, statement, benefit until you create space and you communicate what's relevant to them in a concise manner. Okay? Information overload is, is a huge issue at the show. One of the biggest mistakes I see in the in-booth presentations is we go talk way too long, way too deep about things that we think are important that might not even be important to the listener. Okay? I'll give you a few techniques on presentations in a moment. But less is more. Number 12, they've got to have what I would call a commitment or a closing mentality. What I mean by that is they understand that the outcome of the in-booth interaction is to get the visitor to commit to take a clear next step. They, they know what the next steps are. They have a natural, easy, non-threatening way of asking for commitment. They know when and how to end and get out of interactions. So I have thrown a lot at you here in the last several minutes, 12 attributes. Here's the question. How does your staff measure up? Okay, so let's talk about three ways to improve staff productivity or find staffers if you need to. Number one, evaluate your current exhibit staff. Some form of an evaluation system, okay? I've got a staff evaluation tool. Normally, you only get this as part of exhibit staff training with me. Courtesy of NA, I'm going to give this to you for free. If you shoot me an email, jefferson at tradeshowturnaround.com, I will send you this form, if not today, first thing tomorrow. Give it to all your booth staff. Have them rate themselves on the attributes. Ask them to turn it into you if you're the exhibits manager and look carefully at it. If you find that your team scores low in three or more areas out of the attributes, you might have a staffing issue that needs to be addressed. And again, your people are going to make or break you. So free tool, no obligation to do anything on your part. Ask for it. I'll send it to you. It's worth the price of admission. Okay. Second, okay, so once you evaluate your staff and you see that, hey, they're, they're good, I've got best people forward, or I need to maybe train on certain attributes and skill sets, the next thing to do is look at other departments in your company. You know, uh, I tell you who makes tremendous booth staffers, customer service people, especially telephone customers. 
They spend all this time on the phone. They love to get out of the office. You put them in your booth. They're like the Energizer Bunny. They, they, it, it's an honor to be in your booth. So look around at different departments in your company. Who else might make a really good exhibit staffer in your company to use to play a meet, greet, engage, qualify role? Okay. Third, if you can't train it and you can't find it at other places in your company, consider renting it. There are many good companies out there that for about $350 to $400 a day. You can put a top-notch professional in your booth that can play a meet, greet, qualify, engage, and hand off to your, your more knowledge people. Tremendous resource. So evaluate it, train it if you need to, look for it at other departments, consider running it externally. All right, nine steps to prepare your staff. And we're moving quite fast here with all this content. Number one, the right number of people. Not too many, not too few. Rule of thumb, 50 square feet per exhibit staffer. Number two, a good mix. Don't load the exhibit up with just salespeople. Make sure you got customer service people are good. Your technical, your knowledge, your, you know, if that's part of your game. Marketing, executives, your R&D team, your recruiting team. Okay, have a nice mix and, 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 and have a schedule that flows that throughout the show. Number three, always, always prepare some form of a pre-show staff prep guide. It would be a Word document that has all the information, the show dates, the hours, what to do, who to see for what, protocol, what to do when competitors come in the booth, how to handle the press, PR, all of this stuff, who to go to for what, everything, what products are going to be in the booth with messaging. Everything goes in this guide. Okay, a wonderful tool. Number four, give pre-show assignments. I don't think anybody should be allowed to just show up at the show and hang out at the booth and hang out at the show. They need to be on some form of a mission, some form of a business reason to be there. Your salespeople, we talked about in the marketing webcast, have them create a list of customer prospect suspects. Have them driving qualified booth traffic independent of what you're doing with the company marketing campaign. Your knowledge, your technical people, writing your FAQs, preparing product messaging. If you're doing any form of physical demonstration presentations in the booth, they're probably planning and training the staff around these. Your marketing staff, you, you're driving the, the pre-show marketing campaign. You're working with the press, the media. You're hopefully overseeing competitive research at the show. You know, so you've got to sign. And then your executives, have them visible and available at certain hours and try to match them up in high-level meetings with other executives. Everybody who comes to the show is, has a legitimate business reason to be there. If they don't, I'm not sure you need them at the show. Okay, so number four. Number five, minimum two pre-show staff meetings. If you're geographically dispersed, do what we're doing here today. Have them log in to go to meeting, go to webinar, Adobe Connect, Microsoft Live meeting, whatever. Uh, and ideally get that week out, about six to weeks out before showtime. Then, last day of the show, you've got to pull the team into the locker room. The game starts tomorrow morning and go over everything. I like to do these meetings in the afternoon on the last setup day, anywhere from 3 to 5, 4 to 7, 6 to 8 p.m. I require my booth staff to be in town by 1 p.m. They have to book their air flight so that they arrive by 1 p.m. They can get checked in and settled in. And make sure you have a formal agenda for the meeting and always kick it off with a key executive in your company. That way everybody knows this meeting is not a maybe. This is a must. And oh, by the way, the president's going to be kicking it off. And if you're not there, your absence will be noted. Okay? Two pre-show meetings. Critical. No professional team would ever hit the floor without the game plan and their pre-show, pre-game meetings. Same thing for you. Okay? Number six, firm booth duty schedule. Firm is the key word. Now, look at the days and hours of the show. And if you've worked the show before, you know, you kind of have a sense where the peaks and valleys are. Look at the uh, educational session roster to see where those are. Look for dedicated exhibiting hours on the roster. Look for that. And consider your hours. Staff up during dedicated exhibiting hours and prime time. You can staff a little down during the slower times. Okay? I like... When I can pull it off and I have enough staff, four-hour shifts, okay? Very few people have the ability to stand in an exhibit for seven, eight hours a day and be effective, okay? So I like to do the AM, PM split shift. The A team comes in from 9 to 1, 
the B team comes in from 1 to 5, and then we rotate them around. And by the way, when they're not in the booth on the 9 to 1, if they're, out, you know, if they're on the 9 to 1, they've got assignments in the 1 to 5 period. They're going to educational sessions. They're walking the floor looking for best practices. They're on tiger hunts looking for people that we want to meet and driving them to the booth, uh, whatever. You know, they're using the show to, to learn. They're using the show to bring us best practices. Maybe they're doing competitive recon for you. Make sure they're working. Got to put breaks into the schedule. The average staff, after about three hours in the booth, their performance drops off radically. So if you are, if you don't have enough staff to do a split shift, make sure you get an AM break, a PM break, and for sure, some form of a dedicated lunch break. Number seven, we've already talked about this one, exhibiting skills training. Consider the cost per staffer. Consider the cost of lost revenue ops. Consider the competitive advantage that you can gain by having a world-class staff. Smart, smart investment of time and resources. Number eight, at the end of the shift or the end of the day, don't just run for the doors at 5, hang around the 5.15, circle the wagons, get the team together, talk about what the goals were for the day and how we did. What worked? Did we have enough traffic? What was working in the booth? What do we do well so we can keep doing? What didn't work so well? Maybe we were swiping cards but not getting data. Tomorrow, let's get more data. Okay, so uh, I liked contests too. I really liked to have a best staffer, and this would be in a medium or large size company, our MVP staffer of the day was. Maybe you have lead contests in play, but again, your end of shift or end of day debrief meetings, every day of the show. I like to view the show like a game. If it's a, a, a football game, it has four quarters. Day one, end of the first quarter. Are we ahead or are we behind? What's working? What do we need to change? That's the idea. Number nine, uh, an end of show meeting, whether it happens in the booth or whether it happens back at your headquarters, big. Uh, if you've got a lot of people, you may want to consider a formal staff survey. If you are going to use a survey, my best tip would be let it be anonymous. That way they can really, and whatever you want to hear from your staff, now is your chance, okay? So nine high-level steps to prepare. I'm talking about putting a world-class staff on the show floor who knows the goals, who has roles, and who is ready to rock this thing for you, okay? Those are staff prep tips. Uh, we're running a little behind on content. I am going to ask you right now if any questions flashed in your mind on this topic of staff selection and preparation, type them in right now. Go ahead and do that. And as you do, I'm going to go ahead and move to now the working of the exhibit, some practices, best practices that you can pass on to your team, okay? Number one is the rules of exhibitorship. Every game has rules, and a trade show is a game. You either win, you tie, or you lose, okay? So some of the rules that are going to help you win when it comes to staffing, number one, be visible, be available, be professional. I walk down the aisle, I look in the booth, I see two or three of your staffers talking together, make matters worse, they're wearing the same shirts. I call that the gang, okay? Visible, available, professional. I look in the booth, they're texting. I look in the booth, they've got a, um, a sandwich in their hand, they're sitting down, it's just amazing, okay? None of that stuff should be hanging. Gang violence in the booth, okay? This is where your, your, your staff clusters together. You, you see, put yourself in the mind of an attendee and ask this question. How easy do you find it to walk up to a gang of strangers? Does it get easier when you know that gang is probably salespeople? Answer, no. Here's the rule. When you're in the booth, put a box around yourself, like a three-foot box. Half of the battle of staying toe-to-toe, -to -toe, talking to visitors, the entire show is simply looking like you want to in a non-aggressive manner. Break it up. No gang violence in the booth, okay? Don't pounce on visitors. Give them a moment, you know. But also, don't ignore visitors. Nobody should enter your booth and exit unengaged. You know, I like to approach people the way they approach my booth. If they walk directly into my booth and walk up to something, I walk directly up to them. People like people that are like themselves. If they kind of meander into the booth and avoid contact with my staff, we'll kind of meander up to them and slowly engage them. Okay? No cell phones in the booth. 
no texting in a booth. It's almost an epidemic, okay? The visitors walking down the aisle, they look in your booth, they see a person standing there texting with a cell phone in their ear, they look away, they're gone. In a big show like this, they might not pass your booth again. You might only get one pass, okay? Respect their time, respect their knowledge, and know that they don't have a lot of time. There's a lot of competition for their time at the show. The average interaction is only three to seven minutes. Respect their knowledge, what they know, and I'll give you some techniques in a moment on how to get them to tell you what they already know and also get them to tell you what they want to learn. Don't overwhelm them, okay? All it takes in the booth is one message to get that visitor to go, this is awesome. I have got to know more. That's it. That's the outcome of a good in-booth presentation. I want to know more. I want it. It doesn't take that much information to get me there. I can't even process that much information on the show floor. Okay, so you see these rules of exhibitorship here, okay? The problem is that, again, if you're breaking these rules, people are going to glance toward your exhibit. They see any of these things, they look away, they're gone, okay? The be back bus might not stop at your booth, okay? So make sure your staff knows these. All right, first 30 seconds of the interaction is critical. Remember the five buying decisions. Decision number one was what? Your people. Okay, attendees are going to make quick judgments about your company based on their perceptions of your staff. There are only two engaging scenarios on the show floor. The visitor walks up to your booth. What do you say? What do you do? The visitor is slowly passing in the aisles. What do you do? What do you say? Well, when a visitor walks up to your booth, here would be four things that would be good to do. Greet them. Welcome them meet them, and ask a discovery question. Greet, welcome, meet, discover. You want to get visitors to slow down and notice your booth. They're passing by in the aisles. What do you do? SOS. Stand, open body posture, put a smile on your face, look towards somebody. That's it. Those are the keys. The first 30 seconds, they're either going to tune in or tune out. They're either going to engage or keep passing by. I've just given you some really powerful stuff on how to deal with both scenarios. Next, there are three types of people that are going to walk in your booth at the show floor, and your booth staff has to know what type. First visitor, casual visitor. I got other na names for them. looky loos tire kickers, time wasters, trick-or-treaters, hungry people, thirsty people. Bottom line, they're not at your booth to learn about something to change a behavior or influence a decision. If you use candy bowls, popcorn machines, water, coffee, whatever, you're going to attract your fair share of casual visitors. What do you do with a casual visitor? Very simple. Question for interest. Ask if they came to the show with a team. What do you do with a casual visitor when you know you got one? Get out of the interaction. Don't stay long. Second type of visitor, information seeker. This person reveals themselves crystal clearly. They walk up to your exhibit and they start firing questions. The problem? Your booth staff falls into what I call the visitor question trap. They end up answering three, four, or five questions, and they, and, and they find out when, when they finally ask what this person does, they realize they just educated the competition. Okay? What do you do with information seeker? I like to question the question. They'll come up and go, well, tell me about your products. I'll go, do you have all day? <laughs> They'll go, no, and I'll go back to my engagement, and then I'll ask, you know, there's so much I can tell you, but let me ask you, what's prompting your interest in? so I can share the right information. Information seeker, question to question, direct them where to learn more information. Solution seeker, buyer, hey, what brings you by our booth? I noticed you were looking at, tell me about your interest. They'll set the stage for you. Your booth staff needs to know what type of visitor they're with and what to do with each type. You also, next skill, you gotta know how to get out of interactions. So there are some simple techniques. Number one, just thank them for stopping. Hey, I've really enjoyed talking with you. I appreciate you stopping by. Number two, direct them where to get more information. You could also, at this point, if you have some form of a giveaway or some form of a tchotchke, it's not your most expensive thing, but something, you know, you could give them something would be another technique. They're going on and on and on. You can't get them to stop. Ask them for a favor. You've thanked them. You've directed them where to learn more. You've given them something. You've asked them for a favor. They're not going away. Create a nonverbal gesture similar to a tag in your booth, train your booth staff on it. You see me standing over here with my arms crossed and my fist under my chin. 
help me out, okay? Help me get out of this. Come over and break this up politely and professionally, okay? Next. This is important, okay? Before you start talking about your company or your products, I, your booth staff needs to know three things. Number one, who they're with. Number two, why they're at your booth. Number three, what they need to do, your booth staffer needs to do, so your company and the visitor gets value. The only way you're going to get there is by asking questions. You should script out a series of three to five front-end must-ask questions. Hey, what brings you by? I noticed you were looking at. Tell me about your interest. Tell me a little bit about your company and what you do with the company. What would you like to learn or hear about in the booth today? What's prompting you to look at this? Get your questions scripted. Train your staff. People will answer questions when the questions are about themselves. Open-ended questions that get the visitor to talk. Okay? Next, anytime you're talking about your company, your products, your services, you are in the presentation mode. You're now presenting to the visitor. So here are some keys. Number one, just enough information to make them want to know more or want it and be willing to take a next step. That's it. It's not the whole story. You don't have the time. They don't have the bandwidth. Just enough. One good message that makes them go, man, this is awesome. I have got to know more. That's it. As soon as you get them to the point of wanting to know, no, close on the next step and the interaction and find another one. Next. Okay. Always assess the visitor's knowledge before you present. Ask, how are you familiar with? What do you already know about? really important. You hit the visitor's information bullseye by getting them to tell you what they want to hear. You know, there's so much that I could tell you about our software, but let me ask you, when you look at this type of software, what are the two or three most important things you want to know? I'm telling you, if they tell you what they want to know, not only do you know what to talk to, but they're further qualifying themselves too. Number four, CPI concise, persuasive, interactive. Here's what I'm telling you. Here's what it means to you, your business, your tenants, your customers. What are your thoughts on this? Here's what I'm telling you. Here's what it means. What are your thoughts? That's the CPI formula. All it takes is one message, CPI. One point at a time, too, by the way. Big mistake in the booth. We cluster a lot of messaging together. Okay, you can see even on the slide how I'm using builds to kind of visually and auditorily give you this one at a time, one point at a time in the booth. Okay? Next, understand that the real outcome of an in-booth interaction is a commitment to a visible next action step. You know, a lot of you are taking what you're calling leads. I, I really call them swipes. Why? They're not information rich. The visitor has not agreed to any next step. The quality of your leads is in direct proportion to the clarity of the next step and the visitor's commitment to take that next step. So here's what you've got to think about. Okay, we meet someone in the booth. What are our typical next steps? Give literature, send literature. Make a call, take a call. Visit a partner, whatever. Go to a session, do a site visit, respond to an RFP, an RFQ, talk to a satisfied... What are your next steps? Quote, proposal, ask for the order. You got to sit down and then train your staff on a very simple two-step technique. It goes like this. Heather, hey, based on what we've talked about here this afternoon, does this sound like it might be worth taking a closer look at? Yeah, yeah, it does. Great. What do you think we should do from here? That's called a collaborative technique. The other one is if they're really dialed in and listening to you, Great, why don't we go ahead and blank, call out your next step, get the visitor to agree to it, capture it on your lead form, disengage, and move on, okay? So we've covered a lot of ground, and I know some of you are going, man, it feels like we're just getting started. I know we're running a few minutes over, but this is prime stuff here, so remember this. I don't care how big and pretty your booth is. I don't care that you've been in business since 1412 BC. I don't care that you're the market leader. I don't, none of that. At the end of the day, your people are going to make or break your success. People buy from people, okay? The attendees are making judgments about your company based on your staff. Best people forward. 
prepare them for success. Don't just let them show up with no goals, no plan, no agenda, and wing it in the booth. Okay, we've given you nine specific techniques on staff prep. Provide some form of exhibiting skills training on how to manage interactions on the challenging floor. If you do that, okay, I can begin to close this webcast not by wishing you a better show. I guarantee you will have a better show. So with that, I am going to throw open the question queue. I know we've run a few minutes over. Many of you will need to bounce. If you want to hang for Q&A, I will stay for as long as, as we can. I'm going to take every question. You should have in your email box right now an email, and I believe it's from Sonia at tradeshowturnaround.com. Please take a moment, complete the survey. If you want the free staff evaluation tool, email me, jefferson at tradeshowturnaround.com. And with that, I'm going to look at the question queue. And Heather, I'll turn it to you for any comments from NAA side. Uh, thanks, Jefferson, and again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, the webinar has been great, and I think a lot of people are going to leave with uh, very useful information. So please, everyone, take advantage of the Exhibitor Resource Center. It's for everyone's benefit. Thanks. Okay, I've got a few questions in the queue, so let me grab these. Uh, number one, how many people should we have in our booth? Well, remember we, remember we said the rule of thumb is 50 square feet per staffer? So if you're in a 10 by 10 booth, two maybe three okay next question uh, what do you think about staff uh, uniforms or apparel um, I like it but it's got to be managed um, the, the problem you know the good the good thing about staff apparel is they're immediately identified as a booth staffer they often might look more approachable than if they're in a suit and tie and they might be more comfortable the downside is if you have a booth full of blue shirts and there's nobody else in there, it can look intimidating. So with the staff apparel thing, kind of, uh, you know, make sure that you don't overstaff, get them to spread out, and don't cluster together. Uh, I do like it. Uh, next question, how, how do you get uh, salespeople, busy salespeople, to be open to this type of instruction? Well, I, I would ask my sales team three questions. Number one. In how you open doors and build, bring in new customers, how important is face-to-face -face time with these customers? Second question, in how you hold on to existing customers and keep the competition outside of the door, how important is face time with customers? Third question, out in the field, are you finding it easier or are you finding it harder to get quality face time? So we're talking about face time supporting their goals in terms of customer acquisition, customer retention. It's harder to get out in the field. They've got to take better advantage of the trade show opportunity. Uh, okay, and the other benefit, by the way, of this type of training, I threw a lot of nuggets in there that even great salespeople aren't doing. And by the way, a lot of salespeople sometimes are the worst booth staffers. Again, they have the territorial mindset. They haven't really thought about how the environment's different. Show them the, the, your cost per staffer per hour and let them know that this type of training will not only help them in their trade show interactions, but it would also help them in their field interactions. Okay, uh, so we've got uh, multiple questions on will this be recorded. Yeah, this is recorded. It will be uploaded to the uh, NAA uh, Supplier Center page. Um, I encourage you, by the way, I would require my booth staff to log in and view it. I would make it a requirement. If I'm not doing my own professional exhibit staff training, I would go, look, if you work in our booth, I need you to log in. Oh, we've been doing shows for you. I don't care. They don't have to listen to the front part. Maybe they should listen to the uh, 12 attributes, but they do need to listen to the back part, the five or six skills that we discussed. I don't care how long they've been in sales, how long they've been doing shows. I'll guarantee you there's something in there for everybody. Okay, <laughs> here comes an interesting question. <laughs> says, um, do you think it's a good idea to stalk attendees? And my answer would be definitively no, absolutely not. You know, they want to be able to move around the exhibit hall and go into booths they want to go in, okay? So remember the technique we gave you of SOS, stand, open body posture, put a smile on your face, look towards somebody, stand, open, smile, SOS. That's your technique for causing people to look at your booth, okay, to look at it. 
you've got to make sure your exhibit quickly tells a visual story. What you do, why they should care, who you are. That's really the visual flow of your exhibit. What, why, and who. Okay? And so your booth staff then is looks non-threatening in an open body posture. They're standing a foot or two off the carpet line. You don't want to be out in the aisles. You don't want to be out there calling people, hey, John, how you doing there? And, and they don't know John from Adam. As soon as John gets called John by his first name, having never been formally introduced, and he realizes he doesn't know this person, you already have a trust issue. Okay? So you want to meet people, and you want to engage people, and you want to be non-threatening. But no, stalking, <laughs> and I love the way you stated that, Lisa. Stalking would be an absolute no-no at a show. The attendees do not want to get pounced on. They don't want to get hooked, but they have come to the show to learn, to see what's new, to find solutions to problems, to benchmark their existing practices against how others are doing it. They have an open mind. You've got to do a good job with your pre-marketing, with your exhibit design, and with your staff. You will get your fair share. Okay, so that's all I've got for questions right now. I've really, really enjoyed presenting this. Had a great turnout on today's webcast. Uh, make sure you complete the survey. Send me the email if you want the tool. And make sure that you get on the um, Exhibitor Resource Center and access all of the cool resources that Heather and the gang at NAA has set up for you. And if you do, I promise you, you are on your way to one of your best shows in years. So from everyone on my side, Competitive Edge, thank you so much for logging in. From Heather and the team at NAA, thanks for logging in. This concludes today's webcast on Secrets of the Isles. Thanks for logging in.